Okay, we're now recording. Uh, this is going to be a lecture for uh, CIT 251, uh, lesson three, topic one. We're going to part two, talking about uh, security audits. Um, and uh, we'll get started because uh, we got a good amount to go, and hopefully, we can wrap it up uh, today. Uh, although we failed in that last class, but we'll, we'll, we'll make a part three in Networks 3. So be it. All right, uh, first thing I want to do is I want to look at the web page, which we did do last class, but I should have. Um, here you see the web page. Uh, I put out some more postings. Uh, um, uh, this is the, the distant one, the D80 one, but they're, they're pretty much mirrored as much as possible. Uh, so again, um, there's a permanent link right now under, so if you lose that or the announcement that it was made or you didn't make a note, whoops, it's under, in this case, it's under uh, boot, which is the welcome screen. Um, and right here is the link to the, the Zoom, okay? Uh, again, if you click this link, because you've noticed the password, there is a hash going back into hash. Uh, and since you know what the password is and you know this, you can really figure out what hash they use. But anyway, I'm guessing by the look of it, it's just uh, not an MD5. Um, anyway, uh, I'm trying to think which hash it is. But anyway, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's a better hash than MD5. You can tell it's by the length. Um, anyway, uh, so right here you can see the passwords included in with the link. So if you click on that, you'll just get in. Uh, all right, um, before we get started, any questions about the class in general? All right, so we're going to get started then. Uh, we're going to be doing lesson uh, three, security audits, uh, topic one, and we're going to be going over these slides. You can see part one is already posted on here, and it's, that's true for both. All right, last class we talked about uh, what makes up a, uh, a good audit as far as the parts of uh, uh, the pre-audit, the uh, the actual audit itself, and the report. Um, again, we're staying very theoretical in this. This is this is an overview. This is not a step by step. Now, for the overview for baseline, whoa, hello, my RAM has had enough. Wow, RAM just not happy. Something I guess Chrome is really slow. I don't know. Um, so uh, it's oh, it's still loading up. That's what's going on. All right. Um, so. Uh, we're going to be using the NIST 800-71 as a basic guideline. Again, that's a federal uh, uh, defined security audit. If you're interested in what it looks like, you click on this link. You actually download the, PD, uh, the PDF. Um, uh, but essentially, it's for the federal government. If they're going to, if anyone's going to have CUI, uh, un, uh, um, uh, controlled, unclassified information. Uh, on their network. So the, you're going to have something from the federal that's not classified, it's not military secret level, but it is something that the government wants to control, names, dates, that type of thing. Uh, your network has to go under the certification. If you do a quick search online, a lot of people are very interested in being NIST 800-171 certified. That way they can have certain contracts with the federal government. All right. Uh, so we talked about the, the three phases. Uh, we're going to get into details about that. We talked about what artifacts are. Uh, now we're going to talk about going step by step. Uh, and again, this is the part where we're about to go on a long journey here. Okay. Uh, and again, this is very much based off the NIS uh, T800. Uh, in this case, I have a listing. I actually spent time. Oh, now this is the PDF. Uh, here's, here's the regs. I spent time for whatever reason just breaking out all the regs so I have a better idea of what was in them and under, understanding it. And so I made a little Google document where I copied and pasted every single requirement of the NISTA. But we're going to talk about primarily these, these sections, the physical protection, security assessment, risk assessment, which we're going to talk about next, uh, next uh, topic, uh, um, uh, risk assessment. Uh, but I broke this out just so I would have a better understanding and I can talk somewhat intelligently about what I'm about to say. But we're going to primarily focus uh, on... Um, those, those headings, okay? Uh, but we have to do it, uh, uh, by the way, this is a freaky video, if anyone, this is a link, it's a Radiohead song, but uh, it, it's also based off a Spanish uh, short movie. Um, the short movie is, um, does have uh, nudity and obscenities in it, so keep that in mind. This one doesn't, because it's just, it, it's an edited down version for the video. But anyway, uh, just talking about, you know, someone's entire life type thing. All right, um, so uh, uh, again, um, why do we, we wanna be meth me methodological. We wanna be systematic here, right? We wanna follow a guideline. We wanna sit there and just check things off a box. Why? 
<clears throat> again, to the person that's being audited, it can seem cold. It can seem uh, bureaucratic. It can seem autocratic. It can seem you know mean spirited. But we have to be methodological because we don't want to miss anything, right? We have to go in into the audit with a predefined list, right? Now we can tailor, and we're going to talk about this tailoring um, the audit down. Uh, but uh, we can um, we can tailor the audit down. Uh, so not everything. So if there's a wireless section, we can sit there and say we'll ignore the wireless section, right? Because they don't have wireless. All right, we can do that. But we want to have a list of predefined requirements because we want to be systematic so we can have consistent results. Uh, Shivana, did you have a question or was that a, that was a, um, a, a, a misfire? All right. Okay. Uh, so, actually it's kind of grayed out. All right, so there we go. All right, so, um, all right, methods. Uh, so different methodologies, how are we gonna do this, right? So there's different ways you could go by this. Think about, I mean, a lot of times, especially if you become a security expert somewhere, you might be asked to actually write the audit, right? Uh, or tailor an audit or write an audit for a particular place. Uh, if you have to do that, let's talk about different methods, okay? We can go risk by risk, okay? Uh, when I say risk by risk, you tend to go, we're gonna talk about risk assessment next, uh, next to the topic. Uh, but if, we, if you do risk assessment, that's saying, okay, you have this database full of names, you have this database full of credit cards, you have this you know, uh, uh, server full of uh, technical drawings, you, whatever you have, right? I'm just going through a list in my head. Whatever you have that your company is worth something. At the end of the day, your company is worth something. Yeah, it's worth the physical parts, the machines in the machine shop, if that's what you do, or whatever, your inventory. But also, especially in today's modern world, your, your company is more and more based off what you have for digital information, right? So that become once you have an asset, right, you have a risk, right? So the asset by asset as well, right? Then you start thinking of all the risks to that asset. You can sit there and say, okay, you have a web server. On the web server, you have this information. You want to block that out. So that's a risk. Let's, let's go risk by risk. You could do that. But how do you make sure you covered every risk? That's kind of problematic, okay? That's where you come into issue, right? So even if you sit there and say, hey, you have this background database full of this information, did you cover every risk of that database, right? Did you, did you cover the fact that some idiot can come put a plant, a, a plant on top of that server and water the plant? You know, it's tough to imagine everything. Did you cover for a global pandemic, right? It's, you know, uh, I was just thinking of that the other day. I was just thinking of something that needed constant maintenance. Oh, I, you know, your mind wanders in these times. Uh, and the dams that uh, uh, the dams that protect the Connecticut River from flowing, which are are, are flooding, that are all pr pretty much up in uh, Vermont, and um, it just it's one of those things. Is like, okay, who's maintaining that in this time of a pandemic? And there, it, you know, if it started overflowing or cracking, what would we do about it? And can we add flood into pandemics as well? You know, what I mean, it's one of those things. Is you can't think of every single risk, right? So that's one problem with that method. Okay. Asset by asset, uh, then risk by risk to that asset. That's one way you can do it. But again, you might miss an asset, but some people prefer to do it that way, right? And then, but the problem with this would also, and both these risk by risk, asset by asset, is you would um, you would have to tailor that, rewrite that every time for every single audit, right? Every single audit would be completely different. Now, if you're doing it as a self audit, in a way, it makes sense. However, you can add more assets, you can add more risks, right? So. This is gonna be something that's very moving target, right? Threat by threat, well, again, that's a moving target, right? Uh, again, no one was paying attention to ransomware 10 years ago, right? Uh, risks uh, or threats increase and threats decrease, right? There, there's, there's an ebb and flow. So again, it's always a moving target, so you'd be constantly changing the audit. Most audits you see are gonna be, uh, this is the consensus, is gonna be control by control. We're gonna focus and go through control by control. If you remember our controls, that's how we started off this semester, right? We've got our administrative controls, like policies and all that stuff, and we have our technical controls, we have our physical security controls, which I eventually just broke down and made that the third type of control that we generally, generally um, uh, include everything in, right? Controls are relatively solid, right? Again, we were talking about backups back in 19, the late 70s, right? Well, guess what the, be the best defense against ransomware is? Yeah, you can stop the spear phishing, but you can't really stop spear, spear phishing or, or, or uh, phishing. 
The best defense against ransomware is good backups. We were talking back, the, back in the 70s, right? That control was in place. What do we do if our data becomes corrupted? Well, we restore the backup. So if you go control by control, that seems to be fairly static. Controls are not coming and going. Technical controls can come and go a little bit. Granted, we've had firewalls now for 30 years uh, off the top of my head, you know. Uh, so, uh, but intrusion detection devices, intrusion prevention devices, those are relatively new. Those are 20 years old, I'll say. They probably became commercially available 20 years ago. You know, so uh, technical controls of anything will be the thing that kind of uh, changes the most, but the overall concepts and theories of controls and defense won't. So that tends to be a consensus good control by control. Um, don't be a robot. We're better than robots. Mm, well, maybe. <laughs> so uh, it's a checklist, but it's also not a checklist, right? A lot of times you are going to play, uh, you know, the old story of King Solomon, right? Uh, uh, Israeli king, uh, two mothers show up, both claiming a baby. The uh, King Solomon says, okay, I'll cut the baby in half. You both get half. And the person who objected first, he, he deemed to be the mother, which is kind of rough. But it, anyway, the point is you, you're going to have to make tough choices while you're doing this, okay? That's where you can run into issues because some people get power uh, hungry. You have to check your personality. Um, uh, and, and, you know, they, they might get a little sadistic uh, perhaps. But, uh, but at the end of the day, it's a checklist, but you don't need to be a robot. You don't need to nope, nope, nope. You can sit there and say, well, all right, you're 90% you're there, right? Uh, do we want to put a poem in, which we talked about last plan, a plan of action and re remediation? Or do we want to just simply say, okay, you're good, but you know, make sure you get this last part done or make sure you change that one setting, which you can do tonight, right? That type of thing, okay? Uh, so in any case, it's a checklist, but it's not truly a checklist, okay? We need to tailor the process. There's no one suit fits all. Even the NIST 800.171, if you're an auditor doing the official federal one, uh, you need to tailor the controls a little bit. Sometimes the controls won't make sense in every situation. Uh, what we're gonna do is what's called the PPT, people process, uh, stupid thing. Uh, people process, can I move it? I don't, no, I just, uh, I haven't really, I probably got a gearbox. Uh, no, no, auto advance when played, but no. And no, all right, try to get rid of the stupid thing I could. All right, um, so uh, anyway, let me let that go away. Uh, we were talking about people process and, and technology, right? Oops, we actually skipped screens. So remember PPT, people, process, and technology, right? We want to look at the, um, and remember, remember, no, sorry, there's a typo there. Uh, so we're gonna look at the people, we're gonna look at the processes of a company, and we're gonna look at the technology of the people. That's one way to look at it. Again, we're gonna go control by control, but those controls can include people, well, it certainly will control people, right? And we're gonna interview those people at, for artifacts. We talked about that last uh, uh, lecture. Uh, we're going to look at their processes, their business processes, and we're going to look at the technology. Um, any questions before I move on to the next slide? All right, this is where we're going to start going down the rabbit hole. Uh, essentially, I went down the NIST and I summarized every header, right? This is the type of thing you're talking about, okay? Now, confusingly, the very first control we're going to talk about is access control. Not confusingly, I just, because it says control in it, that's what I mean. When we talk about... Uh, Access control as a control, it's the building block of all security. I've said that in Windows 1. Remember, if you can remember all the way back, what I say, and, um, uh, and, uh, NTFS, sorry, I had a hard time. My brain wasn't going back that far. NTFS, New Technology File System, is the building block, the root of Windows 10 security. Why? Because that's the access control. That's how we can control what process, what person touches what file, okay? However, that being said, so it's the building block of all security. It's also, it's one of the core assets of IT, right? Our job is to maintain security and integrity of data, uh, or not, it will, I'm sorry, access and integrity of data. Access is built into the core of IT. It's a very complicated thing. Every time we, a, a, a user gets hired or fired, every time a user changes departments, every time a, a user in their current job gets a new job responsibility, access control gets modified and it becomes a very complicated thing. It's also very technical, which is kind of a, a good thing. Some people prefer that uh, because it's a one or a zero. It's either you either have access, it's either permit or deny, right? Uh, you either have access or you don't. Um, but it can be very complicated. Uh, often is not fully documented. I don't know if anyone's ever worked at a company where they have all their access control uh, well documented. 
I never have, right? Uh, it's really just best efforts and best practices. That's, that's really access control. Because it's so dynamic and it's so uh, transitory, uh, when I say transitory, I, 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 transactional, I should say. Because it's so transactional, almost on a day-to-day -day basis, it's almost impossible to document, right? So it's best practices and best efforts, right? Usually you have your Active Directory admin and your system admins, uh, even your network admins at a lower, uh, at some uh, high, at a higher level, I should say, or depending on how you want to go, um, at a more fundamental level, uh, all are going to be affecting access control, right? And again, they're going to try to follow best practices to do that. Okay, uh, we have awareness and training. Uh, training is a must. We need to train our users. We need to educate our users. We need to talk to our users. So notice it says awareness and training. It also uh, is your communication, right? Watch, you know, almost on a weekly basis. Again, there's a fine line too. You don't, we were just taught, uh, we had a meeting, uh, a, um, a school meeting, uh, a school of STEM meeting yesterday over uh, Google Hangouts. And uh, someone, a, a, a lot of other students don't check their student email as much as you guys do. So thank you for checking your student email. And uh, a lot of faculty members are struggling with that. Um, so someone asked, can you send out a rave, rave alert telling people to check their email? And the president was naturally very um, hesitant to use a rave alert like that because and, and the, because the fundamental rule is you don't want to spam people. You start spamming people with a, a means of communication. So if you sent out a, hey, here's your cybersecurity moment of the day, right? Some days will be complete nonsense. It's like, you shouldn't click on links, right? Well, other ones will be valuable information. Like, hey, there, there, there's someone claiming to be the, be, being the president of the company uh, uh, with an email that kind of looks like their email, but it's not their email. Do not click it, which is valuable information. But because you send it out every day and most of the time it's got garbage in it, people won't click on it and read it, right? You got to find that happy medium, okay? But awareness is part of this uh, control as well. Are you communicating with your users? Are you training your users, right? How, do we gonna, how are we gonna find artifacts about this? Well, uh, again, proof of training sessions, signatures, people signing off on policies, proof that a policy was a reason why you wrote up a, an employee, right? Again, we're not doing that for sadistic means. We're not, ah, ha, ha, we really screwed over that employee, right? We're looking at it because we're like, well, someone probably eventually screwed up. That's just life, right? So if someone did screw up, we're gonna, we wanna see if um, yeah, that, that you, you uh, enforced your policy. Okay, so we're gonna look for that as well. Uh, by the way, awareness and training isn't always, uh, um, or you enforced the fact someone didn't go to training is really what you look for. We're, we're not talking about policies just yet. We're just talking about your communication and your training uh, to your employees. Um, this is gonna go alphabetical, so th there's no logic to it, it's just alphabetical, all right? Uh, audit and accountability. Uh, so check that there's sufficient logging. Yes, that's a moving target. We get more devices, less devices. Um, what is sufficient logging? Uh, there was a weird ringing noise that just was in my house. I don't know what that was about. Um, uh, check that there is sufficient logging. Yes. Uh, so again, what is sufficient logging? Uh, this is where the actual rules come in. Those actual, so if I, if I click back here to that, um, document which I had open but apparently I closed it like a fool um, let's see yeah I, I closed it um, let's well we'll go back to this and uh, I'm gonna go click the regs uh, so we'll look at the NI uh, the NIST the on there um, so here's their example uh, you know case in point access control make sure they're encrypting CUI right I saw that just go by uh, encrypt CUI on mobile devices and mobile computer uh, computing platforms, right? That's a checkbox. So even though I gave you the overall arc, these are the things that you're looking for, right? And there's gonna be some repetitiveness. Like I just saw one go by saying uh, limit unsuccessful login attempts. That's also gonna be during accounting too and authentication, but it's the way they wrote up this thing, okay? Um, anyway, uh, audit and accountability. Uh, so ensure that actions of individual system users can be uniquely traced to those users so they can be held accountable for their actions, right? That comes down to logging, right? Review and update logging events. That's, that's for them. They review and they update their logged events, right? So they're not just making logs, they're looking at them, right? These are the type of questions. Again, it's, this is why we don't have robots do this. It's going to come down to personal judgment, right? Someone has to come in and say, hey, you're not looking at, your, you're not reviewing your logs enough, right? Again, there tends to be a consensus and there's books written about, you know, what you should do and it'll be part of your trainer. I'm not getting you ready to run a 
NIST 800, uh, you know, 171, uh, uh, that, that would be a lot of training and we could spend a whole semester just doing what, it, what you know, uh, going through question by question. That's not my goal here. My goal is to let you know how this actually, you know, the, the overarching philosophy and how this would work, okay? Because if you do do audits, you chances are will not be run, you will not be doing an NIST. You'd have to be doing that for the federal government, right? It gets, it can get um, contracted out, but uh, whoops. Um, anyway, so audit and accountability, we're gonna look at logs. Are they logging enough? Are they reviewing their logs? Uh, ensure that, that there's sufficient allocation, possible rotation and responsibility. That's also in there. Um, again, that's just the way they broke it down. Um, configuration management. Uh, we're gonna look at IT's processes of changing hardware, software settings. Uh, establishing a baseline is important. Uh, ensuring the entire system security is not compromised when there's a configuration change. We're gonna look at maintenance. Does IT maintain systems mindful of sensitive data and privileged system access? So again, these are systems, we things we talked about in previous semesters and this semester. We talked about uh, secure network maintenance. That's what we're talking about there, right? Uh, is just because we sit there and we take a server and we're, uh, we're updating it, doesn't mean we open it up, and, you know, we do a permit any any on something so anyone in the whole world can hit that system and access sensitive data, right? So uh, you gotta stay mindful of that, right? <clears throat> uh, identification authorization evaluates IT's process of authenticating users, password management policies. Uh, so someone in the federal government, I think it was congressmen and senators, got a bug up their butt. And I'm saying this is a good thing, actually. Uh, some, some, somehow someone got something in their ear and it's stuck that uh, the, the, one of the biggest complaints, not complaints, but one of the biggest headaches of the NIST 800-171 is it requires dual factor authentication right uh, which is a a fairly good it's a good standard right is it high yeah, in today's modern world it probably isn't even a high standard right do a lot of companies implement that especially like you know uh you know a company with 50 people in it probably not right so uh all of a sudden doing dual dual factor making those damn those damn feds are making us do dual factor authentication uh is something i saw out there a lot with this so i just thought i'd mention that but that's the type of thing you'd see under identification authorization Right? Are you identifying your users? Are you authorizing them? Right? Are you authenticating? Are you authorizing? Again, we're going control by control. These are things we've talked about. Okay, uh, that's going back to AAA. And believe me, we already did auditing. Uh, we're going to do accounting as well soon. Uh, incident response, uh, something we're going to talk about at the last part of this course. Uh, this course, uh, but uh, do we validate and verify the organizational plans to respond to cybersecurity incidents like viruses or hacking attempts or you know? As simple as your web page got uh, uh, graffitied or, or, or vandalized, all the way up to your database got uh, uh, got compromised, right? Your 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 what is your going to be res your response? So you're looking for the plans. You're looking for the 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 uh, when we go back to controls, the compensating controls. What are you going to do if you do get hacked? That's what we're looking for here, right? Uh, to and uh, to respond to natural events like viruses. That that that's the joke. So, uh, you know, like viruses, like viruses, right? So if we have natural events like earthquakes, comets, and now uh, pandemics, uh, what's gonna be your company's, right? So there's a lot of companies out there wishing they came up with this scenario when they were doing their, uh, when they were doing their uh, uh, game planning, when they were doing their uh, table, uh, tabletop exercise. Uh, what do we do during a pandemic, right? Do we have enough N95 masks, right? That's these type of things, all the stuff we're hearing in the news. Uh, and I want to bring us back to the, the real world, which is kind of unfit, uh, 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 not, not nice right now. Uh, so some of the other things we want to look at. Media protection, uh, validate and verify organizational technical and administrative controls in regards to removal media. I like that this is a separate section because this is a high, a high vector. At least it was, particularly in my day, um, back in my day. In the, in the mid to uh, uh, late, late 2000s, the early 2010s, uh, media protect uh, uh, USB sticks were the way. It was the it was this it was the phishing attack of its day. Matter of fact, that's what Stuxnet used, right? Uh, so it was it was even sophisticated enemies, which in all reality was the U.S. government, maybe the Israeli government, used USB sticks to get a virus into Iran, right? Uh, because essentially we all had Windows uh, XP still back then, and there was very little media protection. So uh, anyway, so. Uh, 
it's near and dear to my heart. Uh, but uh, is it, again, that's the one of the things you're going to have to get going control by control. It's in here. Is that still an issue? Do people still do a lot of USB sticks? No, because we do the cloud stuff, right? Do we need to have it now a new control for cloud? Perhaps, right? This is always going to be, you know, welcome to IT. It's always changing. The moment you learn something, you move on. Uh, also keep in mind our backups are probably on removable media. Uh, so that's going to be part of it too. Uh, you're going to look at things like what do you do to secure uh, 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 your removable media? Uh, do you lock away your backups? Uh, do you put them in a secure uh, environment that uh, has heat control? Uh, going to Mr. Robot reference. Uh, uh, do, you, um, do you lock down your user's laptop so people can't plug in USB sticks, right? Uh, or at least not with administrative privileges, right? So. Uh, these are all uh, things you might look at, okay? Supply chain risk. We talked about supply chains, right? Again, if, I, if you have a super lockdown system, right, uh, let, let's, let's go to a historical reference, right? I have a, a fortified city that's unpenetrable, right? Um, what could I do to possibly take down this fortified city, right? Well, I surround it and I siege it. Well, and, and what are the things that people need in siege? Well, they have a lot of foods. So you have the granaries and there's lots of historical references that before you siege the place, someone would send some rats into the granaries, right? To eat the grains, to poop in the grains, to make the people sick, spread plague. Uh, or if there was water source going into that city, either river or well, you would poison their wells, right? Supply, if you have a very uh, uh, secure target, what you can do is you can uh, hit the supply chain. So case in point, if I have a company I'm going after, and maybe I'm an APT, I'm an advanced persistent threat, uh, and I'm working, so I'm working for the government, uh, and uh, I'm going after this company. So, because this would be a high-level attack, or if you're real, you know, super, the super hacker like you see on TV. Uh, what I could do is I can instead of going, I say, the wow, this company's really locked down. Good for them. Hey, cool. Check out though. They, they, check this out though. They 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 have this vendor that works for them, a small mom and pop software company that makes this little crappy software for them, and uh, they have sh terrible security. And they, and they update their software for them. So let me just stick a little piece of malware in that software and we'll get it in there, right? And see if we can sneak it in, right? I'll triple encode it, I'll Swiss cheese it, I'll, I'll, I'll armor up the code, whatever I need to do to try to get past their uh, antivirus. And maybe I can sneak in a little malware through the company through their vendor, right? That's like a supply chain, right? That you're, you're hitting, uh, um, so we're gonna ensure that our vendors are can be trusted, okay? Uh, Again, this thing popped up and I'm, as I'm at the bottom. Personal security, onboarding. Uh, so again, we this is something we talked about this semester. Uh, background checks is something they do, personal security in the uh, 800-171. Uh, and offboarding, these are all good, you know, these are good um, SOP, standard operating procedures, right? Uh, when a, an employee gets in, are they, are they, uh, do they get some cybersecurity training? Do they sign off on the policies? Do so, does someone read the policies to them? Or do they, are they supposed to read the policy? Sign this, okay, we'll sign this, sign this. But they're not reading them, right? How can we know they're reading them? Like we might wanna verify that, okay? Oh, I got some chat, two chats. Uh, okay, there you go. Um, all right, uh, so personal security, uh, media protection. All right. Physical protection, there's a lot of these things, right? The, the, the 800, 171, and, and this goes back to that media protection one. It, it, it's clear they're, res, they're resilient about taking things off, uh, but they seem to be pretty good about putting things on. There is redundant, in my opinion, going through it real quick. Uh, when I wrote it all, the, or I copied and pasted it all over to my Google Doc, there was redundancy. I was like, what's that doing there? but that probably was put in there at one iteration and they're just resilient to take it back out. And, and now there's another whole section where that uh, very similar question is, right? Now what ends up happening, especially if you have a large audit like this, and you'll see this in the, in the practice for this, uh, this uh, lesson, uh, is you're going to see um, teams break out, right? It's like, so you, your team is gonna be responsible for personal security, physical protection and risk assessment. Usually you try to break it down a little bit uh, more um, based off like so you might have someone do access control auditing and authentication and identification right you'd break off those three controls because they're all somewhat kind of related right but if you have one that's kind of, you have a question that's um, similar in two different very different areas you're getting double verification which is a a little wasteful but be kind of more secure again it's that constant balancing act you know checking something every day to make sure it's secure does it make that more secure or less secure 
anyway, um, uh, so just point of order. All right, uh, where was I? So physical protection, does the organization uh, control access to its vital IT infrastructure and maintain logs of uh, uh, authenticated and authorized personnel who access said infrastructure? Does the organization protect itself against physical attacks to the infrastructure, right? Stuff we talked about when we talked about physical security controls, right? That's, that's in there. Risk assessment this is what we're going to talk about next topic. Uh, does the uh, organization monitor its own risk? Does it know what its risks are? Does it scan for new vulnerabilities? How does it remediate uh, newly discovered vulnerabilities, right? Pretty cut forward, right? Security assessment, does IT, this one's kind of re very redundant, um, but it's in there. Does IT monitor controls to ensure continued operation and effectiveness, right? Are they constantly self-assessing, right? This is really what's asking, right? Uh, I think that could be under system information integrity, but anyway, who am I? Uh, uh, system and communications protocol, uh, what do you do to protect data in transit? What do you do to protect data at rest, right? That's what we're talking about, right? Um, again, we talked about this in the various security classes, one way to organize data is say, hey, either data is moving or it's, it's, it's being stored, right? It's either in storage or it's being calculated or being transmitted over the network, right? So if that's the case, we can look at it that way. What are we doing to protect our data that's in transit? What are we doing to protect our data that's at risk, right? Um, also, but uh, a key component here is uh, when it leaves their system too, right? So part of this is well, what happens if you send the, that data to a, a vendor? What are you doing, right? In a way, this is, this is funny. This is the federal government saying, hey, we want to send you our data, so we're going to ask you what you do if uh, your data leaves you, right? It's kind of a Russian doll type thing, all right? Uh, system and information integrity. Uh, does IT check for, log, and investigate anomalies ion in uh, the system that should be in the system uh, and in the data, okay? <clears throat> uh, so those are all the subcategories they have in the NST 800-171. Uh, there's a lot there, um, and there's even more when you break down the actual individual questions. The reason why I gave you this uh, as a, again, this is theoretical. I'm not having you memorize this. That you're not gonna get tested per se on this, right? What, I'm, uh, what I will do is I will ask you, maybe on the critical thinking questions that come along with this lesson on the next test, what I will ask you is, um, you know, you're working on this particular assessment. It says this, right? What's your take, right? That type of thing. Um, uh, and, and in that regard, again, you're, you, you, we're less so talking about this particular lesson and more so talking about previous lessons, your understanding of security, right? Is that secure? Is that not secure? Obviously I can't put too much gray area in because there has to be a definitive answer. Uh, and that's the problem with this. There, it's very tough to have a definitive answer, right? Again, we're not robots. Uh, so I hate to be kind of, um, wishy-washy on this whole thing. But the reason why I went down this whole list was just to give you an idea, and this is the core of the NIST uh, 171, is, um, is this is how they organized it, right? Just to give you an idea of their step-by-step, -step, control by control methodology, all right? Any questions before we move on to the next section, how we report our findings and deal with non-compliance? All right, I'm gonna move on. If you have any questions, just uh, go ahead and speak up or raise your hand, uh, which is under participants, uh, raise your hand. All right, the report, again, we talked about this, but I'm gonna bring it up again, the power of the summary. Uh, sadly, this is all some will read, right? So especially nowadays, people have a lot less of attention span, okay? And I can't complain because I'm one of those. Uh, you know, I. I do, you know, I, I'm, I'm the president of the Neighborhood Association. Do I read through every single financial report I get from the finance? No, I, I look at the summary and make sure we didn't lose too much money and I nod my head, right? So, uh, or gain too much money, uh, either way, right? There's, there's no, I, I kind of rely on other people to read the fine the details, right? It's, it is life. I don't mean to make this sound sadly as in they're, they're awful people. People are busy. Sometimes it's all, and, and also they might not have the technical understanding to read the, the main body of the report as well. But need, so it needs to be accurate, but not too technical. Again, that's a balancing act. It's hard to be perfect on this, right? A, what you want, might want to include a little background for context, just a little bit of history, right? Again, you could have a, a somewhat unsecure network, but it came from being very unsecure just five years ago, being hacked five years ago, being completely owned by malware from three different hacker groups, right? But now they're somewhat secure, right? That's, a, that's an achievement, really. Uh, so you gotta have context, right? 
and I, and I sit there saying it's it's okay that they're just they're only somewhat compliant. No, what I'm saying is they're moving in the right direction. Okay, uh, what the rules of the engagement were here, or you can uh, or this is the summary here, or in the um, uh, conclusion, you can. Uh, so people like to put it in different places. I like to put it here uh, because I think it's important to read before you find the findings what the rules of engagement are. Although that can end up being very technical and putting a little too much length in the summary, therefore causing readership to drop. Uh, so you might want to put it at the end. Uh, overall posture of the system. This is the big one, right? Is it secure? Is it not secure? This is how people might get hired and fired, okay? So it's a lot of pressure when you write this. Your system sucks, right? It is unsecure. Uh, heads might roll, right? So, uh, but this is, this is the meat. This is the, this is the red, this is the bleeding heart, right, of, of the report. Uh, is the system, is it relatively secure relative to the rest of the uh, networks in the same industry? Is it not secure, but it's improving, right? What, and again, you have to, also there has to be context, right? Uh, for a, like, I'm gonna pick on a higher education. Higher education networks tend to be less secure than financial institutions, right? Uh, a, educational institutions don't spend as much money on their IT, and B, well, they're about academic freedom, right? If you wanna download a hacking tool and start playing around with it, you need to be allowed to do that, right? Need, need to be allowed to do that. While obviously a financial institution, if you downloaded a hacking tool on uh, Mass Mutual and they had an IDS on their system and saw that file, oh, you're gonna get a talking to, right? And it's gonna be blocked, right? If it's IPS, it'll block it, right? So um, again, it's relative to your industry as well. What basic, not full risk assessment risks are, uh, are there? Um, so um, you don't, it, this isn't a full risk assessment, but you might want to include a basic risk assessment, uh, which will cover next uh, what a risk assessment exactly looks on. A little bit of numbers, you know, based off your the value of your assets. Right? This is almost like uh, thinking, uh, it just popped in my head an antique roadshow. Based off the fact that I say this is worth thirty thousand dollars, I would insure it for this much, right? Uh, but based off how much you evaluate your asset, this is how much money you might want to spend on IT security. Okay. Uh, that might be something you put in the report. Again, that's doing a, a summary risk assessment. If you wanted to show the, your numbers and do a full risk assessment, that would have to be an extra thing. But this is just saying vaguely, uh, uh, also how, you know, risk assessment comes down to dollar values, which we'll talk about. Uh, you probably can see that, right? Here, I'm on video, I'm probably, but I, I, I just scratched my chest and looked like an idiot. But anyway, um, uh, uh, risk assessment, in my mind, always comes down to dollar amounts because that's what's going to get me budget. Uh, so, there, but there's multiple parts to a risk assessment. There's there's a how risky are we, right? And b how how less risky should we be? Uh, uh, and that's usually based off dollar amounts. So, uh, what general, not too specific changes would you make? Uh, again, warning, <laughs> danger. Will Robinson. I didn't put a link in here, but. Uh, uh, this could also be a highly charged part. This could make your this could make or break your report because if someone sees you trying to fish in for more consulting work, or you know, recommend your brother-in-laws this for the uh, uh, security company or conflict of interest or something like that. Uh, so, in general, very generally, what areas do you think they need to spend more time? Again, try to avoid specifics. Uh, that's where the poem is going to come in, uh, and but that's their suggestions too. So. Um, we'll talk about poems in, uh, uh, in, a, in a moment. Uh, but so this could be this could be a bit of a, a hot spot. So just keep that in mind, okay? Uh, most political section, often reviewed before release, can be very stressful, okay, to write the summary, okay? Usually the overall person that's in charge of the report writes the summary, uh, when I say in charge of the entire audit, that gets sent up usually to uh, a political talking head. A lawyer might look over it, depending on the company, the, the structure of the company or the policies of the company. Um, uh, so again, uh, uh, there's a lot of stress and a lot of politics involved in the summary, right? And again, I say that not as uh, politics is a bad word, which a lot of people like to use as a bad word. Uh, I think politics are inherent. You get two people in a room, you got politics. So. Uh, you know, the only way to avoid politics is shooting those two people in the room, right? That, which is a bad, bad outcome, right? So you can't completely get rid of politics. So just know that this is a very political thing, okay? Um, so <clears throat> that's the summary. Any questions about the summary before I move on? All right. 
So we're going to findings or discoveries or assessment, okay? The technical meat of the report, right? This is all, this is all the technical facts, right? We move from require, this is where you actually make the report and you go requirement by requirement, right? Each requirement has a method of assessment. How did we come up with our answer, right? We were going to have the answer too, right? Pass, fail, uh, comp, uh, compliant, non-compliant. It depends on how, who's running the report and how they like to do it. And I couldn't really find a, a, a set way and how the government, the government, I think the government uses compliant, non-compliant as but um, I, I or, or, uh, well, there's also fully compliant, somewhat compliant, right? There's, there's levels too, there's gray areas, okay? Uh, but so what our, our um, assessment is, right? Of the requirement, the requirement, the assessment requirement, our method of assessment, any relevant artifacts, I would put them here. Sometimes people put them all in the conclusion uh, and then they, they just reference them. That's fine too. Who reviewed and validated these findings? Most good security audits will actually, because especially big ones will have who did it. If, you're probably gonna, if, if it's a big security audit, it's gonna have multiple people working on it. If it's just a quick security audit, it'll probably have one person they can sign off on the bottom, right? But um, if it's a really big audit, it's a big report, per requirement, you sit there, who signed off on these, the, these uh, findings, right? I, I say you fail, this is how I decided you failed, here's my proof you failed, and this is me saying I failed you, right? So. Uh, kind of uh, a little bit of accountability there. All right, uh, James, go ahead. Okay, so what does any relevant of artifacts basically mean? So again, artifacts is any proof that you have either showing compliance or not compliance. So let's just say, uh, we'll go back to the logging, right? And I say, um, uh, I say you failed that you don't review your logs, okay? And my artifact to that would be, uh, a policy that you wrote down that you say you review your logs once a year, but then I emailed you and said, okay, when was the last time you had a, a, an official and, and your boss? And, and I said, when was the last time you had a review of the logs for this particular server? And the answer comes back is, uh, well, three years ago, we looked at it, right? That could be my method of assessment. And that could be my artifact, that email and your policy saying you're not even following your own policy. Okay. And so that would be my artifacts. Uh, does that make sense? Makes sense. Thank you. All right. um, thank you for the question. Um, so, uh, Poem, uh, if you do fail someone, right, for each failing or non-compliance, we, we could, I like them, have a poem. Now, it depends on the people that's, because usually, and you'll run into this if you ever do a security audit, and I've been on both sides of the table, right? And the security audit I did was very bare bone basic, but I've been audited quite a few times, right? And it is, Oh, every so every time I've done it, every time I've I, I, as both uh, auditee and auditor, um, it tends to be if you do have a failing, the the auditee usually has a response like, yeah, we don't, you know, we're we're not we're not uh, uh, accounting for that information very well, right? We don't have a log on who's accessing that file, right? But we're gonna get this piece of software that's gonna do it for us, or I will enable auditing on NTFS and we will review it this time, right? Almost always, some, like, think about every time you've been to court, right? Yeah, officer, I was breaking the law and, and doing this, but I have a reason why and I'll fix it, right? That type of thing, right? And almost every time someone has that as a response, or almost every time. As a matter of fact, it's more damning if they don't, right? So if they do, you can put that in the report, and that's what we call plan of action milestones, okay? Uh, so how specifically, we try to be specific, this is the one where we're, we make sure we're very specific, because again, we're getting the answer from them. So this is not political. This is the person being audited saying, we have a fix for it, okay? Hopefully that fix will actually address it. If it doesn't address it, then you're like, well, that's not really a fix. Uh, and you can, you can not include that as a poem. But they give you a fix that they're actually gonna implement. You can write that down and say, okay, this is how they'll fix it. We put milestones, not just plan of action, milestones. Why? Because we're IT. There's always a fire, there's always smoke, there's always something that can need improvement. If you don't put a deadline on it, it ain't gonna happen, okay? So we put milestones on there. All right, so uh, it depends on the report, depends on the type of report. You can put a hard date, an actual day, by this day. Uh, usually I go by the months I, I, or years, right? It should be implemented in the next year and a half, right? Um, uh, it's a little wishy-washy, but also IT fires happen, right? So, uh, uh, you know, and someone can look back at the security audit a year, two years later 
and say, and by the way, there could be another security audit in two years. They can look at the previous audit, that might be an artifact, and say, wait, you failed again, and you didn't fix it like you said you were going to fix it, right? That could be pretty damning, and now you have another artifact, right? Um, any questions but, uh, on the meat? And then we have the conclusion, summary, conclusion. So again, you, uh, you can have introduction, summary, you can have summary, conclusion, right? The, the summary up top, the conclusion on the bottom, you can have introduction up top, conclusion on the bottom, uh, intru uh, introductory on top and, and uh, summary on the bottom. It, every report is a little different, okay? Uh, usually what I like to see is summary up top and conclusion at the end. But again, there's no, I'm putting a lot of ors in here to let you know there's no perfect way to do this, right? Uh, and I'm not telling you specifically how to write anything up. I'm giving you general guidelines, all right? Uh, so summary or conclusion may be repetitive, all right? Uh, will be the second most uh, read part of the report, okay? Repetition of key components is not always a bad idea, right? Uh, overall, the best way to do it, this is gonna be a more technical version of the summary, right? This is gonna be, a lot of times, uh, one way sometimes so, so someone explained it to me this time uh, or, or one time that the, the the first part the we'll call that um, summary the first summary the, the header right the introduction is for the which actually has the overall security posture so you can argue it's also possibly a conclusion uh, anyway what, what you call it is up to you the first part is for presidents CFOs and CIO or I'm sorry uh, uh, Chief CEOs, um, uh, it, it's it's for non-technical people, right? Uh, for the management that possibly paid for it, that um, they maybe they want to hang people, maybe they want to support people. I don't know what they want to do. That's for the non-technical people to read, right? The middle part is for the technician, kind of like the student going through their grades and ripping through and saying, "What, what, what do you mean I got to fail?" And then that's why I'm listing all my artifacts and my method of uh, assessment. And the, the, the last part, the conclusion or the end paragraph is for the CIO or someone that's somewhat technical uh, who's looking for an overarching technical report so that they can bring counter arguments to their CEO when they ask them, hold on, this says our security posture is you know, mediocre for our industry or, or moderate. Or we have a moderate security posture, however you want to word it, in our industry. What the hell? Right, and, and so um, the the last part, the last uh, page, or the last part of the report, the conclusion, if you will, uh, will uh, give more technical bullets for the CIO uh, to kind of either defend it or to tout or say we're going to fix that. Right. Uh, so will be the second most read part of the report. More technical summary, more detailed summary of the findings, highlighting the failures and recommending actions and plans of actions. Again. That's going, but what I just said, right? This is kind of the talking points to saying, okay, yeah, we're really good security, but we failed in these two things. What are we doing to fix that, right? Um, so uh, be uh, more dire warnings of risk and exposure, but be warned you cannot anticipate every threat and risk, uh, just educated guesses, okay? Uh, I, I, I have a personal uh, allergy to anyone who thinks they're Nostradamus, even though, especially because Nostradamus is full of shit, so. Um, anyway, so, uh, I, I've just seen too many cocksure answers where it's like, oh, this, this is your primary risk. You're like, well, you don't know that. It, it's a risk, but it's not like, you know, that's your personal bias of what, what, what you think our highest risk is. But anyway, that's from personal experience. So take that for what's worth. All right. All right. Any questions about the report? I'm ready to move on to summary. So um, uh, any questions about anything right now? I'll move it over to the summary and I'll read through it in a bit. But any questions before I read through the summary? All right, uh, let's get going with the summary and we'll wrap it up right on time, I think. Uh, so an audit can be broken down into three components. Uh, preparation, assessment, report. This is me just putting different terminology on it. I'm gonna keep doing this. I'm gonna keep messing with your terminology. I'm not gonna call it an IVV. I'm not gonna call it a TRR. Uh, I'm always gonna call it the report. Uh, I don't know why. But uh, point is, again, we're doing overarching. Uh, this is an overview, right? So we're talking theoretically. Personally, it doesn't have to have uh, three reports. So it can be broken down to three components. Uh, a lot of security audits I see, some like smaller security audits will only have two components, right? The the summary and the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, well, we're talking about the audit. 
uh, I was going to the report there. In that case, a smaller audit could just be a simple assessment and report, two parts, right? I like to think preparation, assessment, report, those are the best audits I've ever been a part of, both as auditee and auditor, where we, we gave the people a heads up, hey, we're gonna need this documentation, send it to us by this date, uh, or I'm gonna show up on site and we'll have a face-to-face -face meeting, please have this documentation ready either on a USB drive, so I can get your virus or on the cloud nowadays, um, so I can get your virus now. Uh, anyway, um, uh, but please have this paperwork for us. So that's the preparation. We're gonna be looking at this. Maybe I'll send you a little heads up on what the report looks like. So we could, we're teammates, right? Don't, don't treat me as an advisor. Let's get through this together. Whatever your strategy is, right? Uh, but you're gonna prepare, you're gonna assess, and then you're gonna report, okay? Uh, hopefully the auditor is independent as possible. We talked about that, right? If anytime you have an auditor in any field, not just IT, independence is the most important thing, right? Again, that, and it cuts two ways independent that they can say whatever they want, but also independent of conflicts of interest, right? They don't want someone's job, so they're trying to get someone fired. They don't have a side consulting gig that will fix all your problems that they're gonna find in the audit, right? So again, that's a two-sided a two -sided sword, okay? An audit should contain artifacts, so the report is given more validity due to proof. Uh, so again, and especially on failings, because people will challenge failings, right? Uh, I should have artifacts to say I'm backing it up with this. I have this email. I have this uh, report. I have these logs. I have whatever I have. I don't. I have a lack of signed uh, 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 user access agreements. Uh, 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 acceptable user uh, uh, policy, right? I uh, so I have something that that proves that you have a problem. Okay. An audit should be conducted in a methodological. Uh, I keep screwing this word up. Methodological way. Myth mythological? Anyway, <laughs> methodological way. Uh, but uh, the ability to adopt uh, situations and realities, um, uh, we can go down lists. Uh, again, we call that sometimes uh, control trimming or control tailoring. Uh, in other words, I keep relying on it, but let me, uh, um, there's a specific part of the audit report that talks about on-premises email. Well, you do, you do Gmail, okay? So that, there is no on-premises email. You're not storing any local copies of your e email, right? So we don't have to do everything in there, right? There might be a couple things that make sense, but um, uh, we can go down lists, but we need to stay cognizant of the big picture, uh, what the list looks like, right? Um, uh, so what actually we have for a list? Again, it's, it's a constant game, especially in IT, especially cybersecurity, where it's constantly changing. Of we want standardization, but we also need to be wary that we're shooting at a lot of moving targets, so we can't be too standard. Uh, we need our report, and that's the format of the report. Uh, we need to report our findings for the technical and non-technical with all the technical details. That way, we can, if people want to contest it, we have our technical facts. You're, you're technically correct in this type of correct, uh, although that's usually technical in two different ways. Failing should be uh, accompanied by plans to remediate. Um, that's the poem. Again, poems don't come from you. This is a big point I want to make. Poems don't come from you. Poems come from your auditee. That's who you're auditing. What are their plans to fix the thing? And when do they expect that to be done? Okay. Um, yeah, I, I wonder if there's a counter argument, a counterpoint to that. Um, and it's possible there is a counterpoint to that. But from my experience, poems should only come from the auditee. Avoid blame and focus on uh, uh, with, I guess, uh, or, or okay, avoid blame and focus on a professional assessment, right? So again, if you're shown to have conflicts of interest or you're not professional, again, um, social engineering comes into effect, right? If you show up uh, well-dressed, well-spoken, right? Uh, less challenges, okay? If you come in cocky with sunglasses and you know uh, chewing gum, right? and walk in like Roddy Roddy Piper, I came here to kick ass and chew gum and I'm all out of bubble gum, right? Uh, you might get some more challenges, right? So keep that in mind as well. All right, uh, any final questions for me? I know I'm running a little bit long, so, uh, but uh, I'm here to answer any questions. Or if you have a question offline, I'll be talking uh, after we stop the recording. But any questions in regards to what we just talked about? All right, I'm gonna stop the share. So we're gonna do that. Stop sharing. Uh, there's everyone. Uh, and uh, well, most these are the folks that survived. <laughs> Everyone else dropped out. 
Uh, so, and you've been seeing the participant. We started off with 11, I think. But, all right, so I'm going to stop the recording, and uh, I'll talk to everyone later. This will be part two. Uh, Friday, there'll uh, just be a, 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 a practice day. So I'll be in this room, uh, and people can ask me questions. But I think the lab's practice is pretty straightforward. But um, I'll be here to answer questions on that on Friday, of course, or via email. Uh, but just not face-to-face -face because we're living in a place. All right. Have a good day, everybody. Stay healthy, stay smart, stay safe.